Good afternoon and welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange Leadership Tools and Strategies. So thrilled to have you in with us. It's Tuesday, May 19th. So excited to have with us our guest, Dr. John Savage. We're going to be talking a lot about the importance of listening in leadership and why that's the starting point for all of us. Before we dig too far into our content for today, I want to remind you about a couple important things. Every Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern, we engage in hashtag nonprofit chat. That's an opportunity for us to dig deeper into the conversation from Tuesday with you and our wider audience. Also, I want to encourage you, just around the corner, our June issue is going to be launching, June issue of Nonprofit Performance Magazine. The June issue focus is giving for impact. So please make sure you check that out. Centervisionleadership.org slash magazine. As always, want to invite you, if you're enjoying the conversations that you're hearing, make sure you come check out our community. Centervisionleadership.org register slash register. Come, come check it out. See what's there. See the opportunities to become a member and engage at a deeper level level. All right, without further ado, so excited to have Dr. John Savage in. Dr. Savage is uh, many things. He's a, a professor. He, he's a pastor. He's a psychotherapist. He's a coach. He's a, a, a leadership systems guy. He's a learning management guy. He's a guy who's traveled all around the globe teaching so many different people in a wide variety of different topics. John, thanks for joining us today. My my privilege to be with you, John, very much. John, John for, for the people that aren't familiar with you yet, you've been doing this for a while. Take us through a little bit of who you are and how you got to today. Okay. I was a pastor for 26 years in upstate New York, an ordained United Methodist minister. And uh, after serving 26 years, I took early retirement, felt God was calling me to do a broader ministry, and uh, and started my own company called Lead Consultants back then. And what we did was to do training primarily in two, at the beginning, in two fields, in uh, introduction and advanced level of, of uh, listening skills, and also in conflict management. And um, uh, we were able to do training with those people, with those subjects, uh, hundreds of workshops, trained thousands of clergy, uh, worked with lots of trainers, trained some 2,800 trainers around the world, and uh, did a lot of work in Australia and New Zealand and England. Uh, was in Australia 19 times wow. uh, and, uh, and found that to be a wonderful place to train, by the way. I also was uh, a young professor at uh, Toronto School of Theology in Toronto for 20 years. Uh, I was there uh, two weeks a year, the same weeks, second week in November, second week of May, uh, the same weeks for 20 years. And um, I have, uh, I do coaching. I'm also a trained spiritual director uh, to help people find the best relationship with God they can in their lifetime. And uh, I found, I find that to be a wonderful piece. Uh, my latest thing, uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it, uh, but I have developed a way of listening to people that I find unique, and that is, and I'd love to do this with, with you, Todd, sometime. I think it would be fun. It's called Listening by the Decade, in which I listen to a person, I record it. Uh, it's like listening to uh, a person in their 80s or 90s uh, or younger. Uh, each decade we talk about what happened to them and how did that form their life. And, um, and then we record those and uh, give the person uh, six DVDs of, it, it's just sound, it's not video. Okay? Yeah. And, uh, but I'm just finding, listening to people for a whole lifetime, of what's happened to, to them, how did they get the way they are, it is really a, very interesting process, but that would move us into uh, the ability to listen. 
John, John, that's that's a fantastic thing. I, I have found so much interest in in the story, the the story for us as individuals. What does that look like? I think oftentimes we don't have a chance to share our story, and and we feel kind of held back. Yeah. One of the things I, I think I see, and I'd love to hear your take on this, is what I see is we almost have these synchronous monologues going on. You talk, I talk. And it's not so much that we're dialoguing, it's just that we're engaging in a, a synchronized monologue. It appears that we're just kind of going back and forth, back and forth, and we seem to be missing the message. I, I've heard you refer to counter story. John, what, what's happening with, with us in this realm? Counter story is on one side a great gift, on the other side, it's your worst enemy. Okay. okay. Let me describe that. If I tell you, Todd, of an car accident that I had, there's a very good chance that within a few minutes you're going to tell me of a car accident that you had. Mm. And that's what we call counter story. The worst scenario of counter story is when a pastor, for example, goes in to a hospital and sees a patient or a church member who has had some illness and the patient starts or the church member starts to tell the pastor about it. When the pastor breaks in and says, well, if you think you're sick, you ought to hear about what happened to me. And that is probably one of the worst behaviors that can happen when you're first starting to listen. I'm not saying that down the road when trust is developed or whatever, you might share a bit of your own story. But counter story inevitably gets in the way. What it is, is my, my counter story is evoked by your story. Now, if I am trained around counter story, I will not tell my story, but I will evoke it in me mm -hmm. so that I have the emotion and the insight of my own story on how to listen to your story. So it becomes a resource when I know how to do that. For example, if you're telling me a story that does not have much emotion in it, but my emotion kicks in as anger, for example, I now know what is happening to you because of what is evoked in me. Mm. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. I think I think that's a a really interesting framework because I think a lot of times uh, we tend to check out. We we hear somebody talking about something and we check out into our own story rather than allowing, as you you use the firm uh, the, the term evoke, uh, le, rather than letting our story kind of evoke the emotions that we experienced and and allowing us still to be able to focus in on the other story. Yeah. So the the hardest part of listening is not listening to what you tell me, but what your story evokes in me. Mm -hmm. Now I have to deal with that as the listener. Yeah. And yeah. the tendency is f for me not to deal with what gets invoked evoked in me by your story, and I will change the subject on you. Okay. Because of the pain or the, the emotion that sits within us? Right. Okay. And <laughs> this may sound odd. The storyteller, Todd, is my therapist. Because of what they evoke in me. Mm. Okay. And there are some people that evoke all kinds of stuff in, in us. Yeah. We don't, that we don't want to deal with. So if I don't want to deal with what is being evoked in me, I'm not going to listen to you because I don't want to deal with me, not you, but me. 
now, now jump let me let me take this because I think this is a really interesting piece. How does that then impact my ability to lead? If if I'm not able to listen to your story or listen to whether I'm in a church setting or a nonprofit setting or a for-profit, if I'm not able to listen to you because of what that story evokes in me, what does that do to my leadership? It gives it a problem. Let me put it into a bigger context. Okay. One of the other things that I've researched across the years is a phenomenon that I call congregational corporate pain. This is the pain that is in the life of a church that has never been talked about, never processed. Yeah. And if there is a lot of that pain in the church, and if that often evokes in the pastor his or her personal pain. So the pastor doesn't want to deal with that in themselves and will avoid all the congregational pain that's, that has gone on. Congregational pain occurs as a result of a set of clusters. A cluster is a series of events that happen in the life of a church that it doesn't pay attention to the emotionality of it. It, it wants to move on. The, the way it shows up frequently is in a church that fires or lets a pastor go every three or four years. Yeah. Number one, they don't grieve that pastor. And they almost, and they're so ready to go get the next one that they don't deal with the emotion of the loss and the grief that comes from the loss of that person. And that's John, and that's, that's John. Kidding, because that's something we see in a lot of organizations. Oh yeah, we, we see that that churn that takes place so often. Um, and, and I, I oftentimes hear, and I know you've heard this, you know. Well, we learned from that one, and now we're going to go do this. We're going to hire this instead of that. Right. And then what happens, Todd? What's the consequence of that? We see pendulum swing. We see never finding any kind of uncovering of what the hurt was underneath. We never grow. We see stagnation and death usually in those okay. organizations. And particularly if there's an event that is really traumatic. Like I worked for four years with a congregation where the pastor, having a very bad meeting, walked out of the meeting angry, went to a lake, it was in February, laid down in ice cold water, took a knife and slipped both of his wrists. They found him dead in the water the next morning. Now, what that did, there, there is not only just the trauma of that event, but it is what the trauma evoked out of the congregation of unfinished grief work for over 50 years in the life of that church. So it's not just the work of the loss of that one man and that event. It is what it evoked out of the depth of, of, of the history of that church. And most pastors, well, fortunately, the next pastor uh, had been through some of my training in conflict management and called and said, I'm in trouble. I don't, I don't have a clue what to do with this trauma and what it's doing to my people. And uh, we worked for four years together and, uh, and got it really worked out beautifully. I mean, they, what, what we do, Dodd, is to turn the pain into creative energy. Mm. That's, that's sort of from the cross to resurrection phenomenon. Okay. Okay? And, um, and what that does, it means I've got to train a team of people how to listen to the pain of the congregation. Mm. And we need to listen to as many different stories, hear what's happened, because, Todd, it isn't. The, the corporate pain is made up of the sum total of all of the pain in the members of the church coming together as a group. Yeah. Now, John, I want, I want to um, catch on to something here that you said, because I've heard you've talked about this, and, and I know you kind of have developed some, a lot of your training around 
story listening. Is this what you're talking about here? The sense of story listening? Yeah. Uh, story listening is the ability to, let me put it this way, Todd. Storytelling is the unconscious speaking. Okay. You don't know why you tell me the stories you tell. It is not rational. It's not, okay? But the story that comes out of you will have, I, I listen for a number of things. I listen for key words, what we call theme. I listen for metaphors images okay and i mostly listen for patterns do i keep hearing this same theme coming up over and over and over again in a variety of stories that theme becomes profound both in listening to a group i mean i've i've done this with ibm i've done it with many many churches done it with school systems done it with medical doctors i mean it it's everywhere, okay? And as a result of that, uh, I have to, I want to go after the, the theme, the metaphor, and the pattern. How it keeps showing up. For example, when you're working with a client, and the client keeps telling you similar stories, that is thematic. And I don't want to make it so simple that there's just one theme. It's often multi-layered. Mm -hmm. And the result of that is, um, uh, well, I, I can tell you one from IBM, okay? Um, I interviewed, uh, I'm going to go to another one, with Hewlett Packard, with Hewlett Packard, okay? Because I interviewed over 300 people in Hewlett Packard. And after a bit, I began to hear different stories, but they contain the same theme. Mm. That's what you're after, okay? Mm. And the, the theme was, at least at this, at that time, I am here to earn money so I can go do what I like. Rather than, I really love my job, and this is what I want, but I kept hearing that over and over. So I went to the vice president who had hired me to come in, and I said, this is what I'm hearing from your people. And I then went and spent 10 weeks of training with that organization. And we got to the root of that, but both organizationally, what can they do to make the work more meaningful? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's how that plays out. When you hear those repetitive themes in the stories, and the themes may be loss, they may be a theme of help, they may be a theme of joy. I mean, it's not all negative. Yeah. Okay? And, um, and so uh, on a notepad that I use to listen, I, I write down key words. Did I hear this word before or in this word? Do I keep hearing it repeated as a common word or an idea? What do, what do I keep hearing in the story? Um, you cannot not tell your story, Todd. Want to try something? Do we have a few minutes we can try something? Sure, we've got about 10 minutes left in our program. Let me try this with you. Okay. I want you to think about something that happened prior to the age of 10. That happened to you. Prior to fourth, fourth grade or earlier. Okay. Tell me the story. Uh, John, I, I was nine years old, and I moved uh, across town. Um, and it was an interesting thing. I, I went from uh, what was at the time one of the largest – elementary schools in the nation to uh, a, a very tiny one. I went from a, a school where we had about six or seven classes within one grade, and I, I moved into a, a place that we had one class per grade. And I remember going from being somebody who, I, you know, I knew everybody had grown up in the elementary school, and I, I ended up going into a school where I was the outsider. Uh, and that's quite a challenge when you're nine years old to experience the sense of 
being new, uh, being an outsider, uh, and, and to go from so large that anybody could fit in to small and finding a struggle to fit in. Name the theme of the story you just told me. If you can find it. From to. Yeah. yeah. From what to what? Yeah, I, I think it's it's the from big to little, from out to or from in to out, from Is there anything happening in your life right now that is in any way similar to that? Or is it reversed? Uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 we, we moved about a year ago, but we moved from one to, to another that was similar size. But right. Yeah. So the move became a common theme. Okay. I, yeah. Another. Uh, Try, try this with friends sometimes, Todd. Yeah. Ask them to tell your story out of early childhood and see how, because why your brain could have picked hundreds of events in 3,500 days. Sure. Which is the first decade. 3,500 days you've been alive. Okay. Now you're going to pick one out of 3,500 days to talk about. Interesting. Why? does your brain pick that one? Mm -hmm. What is there about that story that rings true for you even now? It's a great point. And that's story listening. I, I like that. I like that. And then you make the bridge to what else is going on in your life. Or I can ask many questions now about that. How many times have you moved in your life? Since then, way too many, way too many. Like how many? I mean, just uh, give me a rough. Question. I've been married 10 years, and in 10 years, I've lived in eight different places. Okay. Wee, what's that like? So see how that would then generate more discussion. Would go to what happens to you when you move eight times in 10 years? Yeah. 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 You, you become uh, adaptable. <laughs> okay, very good. That's the upside. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But that's how that works. Mm -hmm. and, and it's never ending. I mean, you, um, I am now, the, uh, one, of, one of my metaphors that I use is imagine drilling down through your life like a nice core. Okay. Uh -huh. And lift it up. And every day is a layer. Mm. You're probably in your 40s. I am 33. Oh, boy, I blew that one, didn't That's I? That's all right. Okay, so you're some 9,000 days old. You could have watched 90. Okay. I'm 31,000 days. <laughs> okay? You can figure out the year later, right? And and we every day we lay down another layer of our life. Mm -hmm. And those all link together, ultimately. Okay, but when you tell a story, you pick one out of 30,000 or out of 9,000, and you tell me, and then the question is, why did you pick that one? Yeah. Why, why that story? Why not one of a thousand other stories or events that you could have talked to me? Because that's what's important right now. now John, this is, I think this is such an interesting piece because we were talking before we got on air one of the biggest challenges that we, we find in leadership is that we're not trained to do these things. You know, and just in this conversation that you and I are having, it's it brings to light so many applications of this. Oh, I, I could see in this setting, if an employer is dealing with an employee going through this, how this might be able to evoke. You know, I, I look at so much of this. How does somebody who's maybe never been trained in this, how do they engage this? Well, you have, you have to be willing to look at yourself 
the leader does, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, and what is their resistance? There's, no, there's only one thing I have to do in working with a client, really, only one major thing, deal with resistance to getting better. Yeah. And you go, well, what's the resistance? What's the fear? What's the pain or, or whatever is going on? And I find that leaders who really know how to listen, and by the way, the further up in an organization you go as a leader, the more you're required to listen mm -hmm. because you're spending more and more time with people. Okay. Well, and uh, yeah, I think that's a funny thing because I think a lot of times people have this image that's totally reversed from that. They think, well, then I get to tell more people what to do. And, and it's really, it's the reverse. Right. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. One, uh, one. I was going to say, I was just talking with a gentleman the other day, and he was talking about a, a conversation he had with Peter Drucker. And he said, Peter, how did you, uh, how'd you get to be so wise? And Peter said, look at the people who come to me. He said, I just sit and listen. He sure. said, these are, these are people from great, you know, executives from all over the country. He said, they come and they tell me their problems. I just get to listen. He said, that's how I got to be so wise. Yet, uh, wisdom comes from reflection on the interaction mm -hmm. and how I play a part in it. <coughs> um, what, what, in your experience, Todd, what do you find happens when the leader doesn't listen but only talks? And by the way, this is an oxymoron that we're doing because we're talking about listening. <laughs> yeah. But okay. It, it's, <laughs> it's at least a start, though, John, because we don't talk enough about it. That's right. So yeah, what, I, what do you, what's your experience with leaders that don't listen? What happens to them? Sure. I, I think, um, and this is based upon some, some work we've done recently um, with, with folks on meaning in organizations. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the feedback that we've heard recently is when people don't feel like their leaders hear them, they lose touch with purpose in their, their work. They, they don't feel valued. Uh, they right. feel, uh, they, to, to your point about uh, the, the organization there at HP uh, some time back, they feel like I'm just here to make money and, and leave and ultimately if I can find somebody else who will pay me better or treat me better, I'm out the door. Oh yeah, that's right. Because I have more meaning and purpose and motivation. Right. Yeah. And consequently, uh, training people how to listen takes some time. Okay. We teach 11 listening skills in our, in our training events. And, um, and, they are life changing because once you learn those 11 skills, including story listening is one of them, okay, mm -hmm. you will never be the same. You'll be a better father. You'll be a better parent or mother. Uh, yeah. You'll be a better friend, a better church member, uh, particularly if, uh, if other people have also learned how to listen so that you can dialogue with each other. That's a great point. And if you're watching right now and you're on our web page, what you'll find is right above the video is a link to John's book on listening. Okay. Want to encourage you to take a look at that. But John, if, if somebody, uh, if they get that book and they, they really enjoy it, you were talking about your workshops. How can somebody find out more about your workshops if they would like to participate in one? Uh, they can uh, email me at uh, jsavage2 at insight.rr.com all right that's, that's my that's my email savage2 uh -huh. at insight.rr.com right or yeah. they can give me a call uh, i'd be glad to talk to any one individual i mean it's fine and uh, that's 614-834-1164 that's my office number okay 614-834 one one six four, right? John, you you've shared with us so many important things today that that really 
just begin to stir up, I think, in us some some really powerful emotions and comprehension of application. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for sharing your, your important work on listening and caring, because I don't think you can, I don't think you, you really work to listen unless you care. So I think those two things, as you have them, go side by side. So John, thanks for, for sharing with us. We're really excited to be able to continue the conversation. I, I, I think Thursday night's Twitter chat, um, that's hashtag Twitter chat, or excuse me, hashtag nonprofit chat. That'll be Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. I think our, our folks are going to be really excited to dig deeper into this issue and to think about what that can look like in their organization. So thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's been an honor to be with you, Todd, very much so. Absolutely. You guys have a wonderful day. So thrilled to have John Savage with us. We look forward to next week's conversation with Megan Keene from the N10 organization. Have a great day. Bye-bye.